I've been assigned the topic reconciling science and faith. And I have to tell you, I usually don't think of my subject that way. What I uh, l like to think about is all the amazing evidence there is for the reality of God as revealed in the natural world. But because there are a lot of people who don't think of it that way, who think that there is a, uh, an inherent conflict between science and faith, we'll do a little reconciling of science and faith today. You may have heard of some of the folks who do think there is a conflict or warfare even between science and belief in God. Uh, one particular modern expression of this viewpoint is uh, well, maybe well known to you. I saw that JP spoke about the new atheists this morning. And some of the new atheists are very well known figures in the culture now. Uh, Richard Dawkins, the British evolutionary biologist, um, he wrote a book called The God Delusion. The, um, uh, another famous book, Breaking the Spell, by the Tufts University philosopher Daniel Dennett. Right here in Chicago, Jerry Coyne wrote a book, Fact. Faith versus fact. You kind of get the idea from that title that the idea is that the idea of the new atheism is that science properly understood undermines belief in God. And it does that. Um, in particular, Daw Dawkins has perhaps the clearest explanation for why that's so. He says that the, the, the best argument for God's existence was always the design argument because. The evidence of design was public. It was, evident, it was something we could see in the, in the natural world. But Dawkins says, but since Darwin, we've known that there is no evidence of actual design, only the appearance of design. And we, the, why appearance? Why do living things look designed, but they're not really designed? Well, because there's an unguided, undirected mechanism known as natural selection acting on random mutations that can produce the appearance of design without itself being guided or directed in any way. So another Darwinian, Francisco Ayala, says that we have design without a designer. We have the effect of design. We have something that looks designed, but it was not produced by an actual designing intelligence. And then Dawkins takes the argument one step further and says, well, if there's no designer, then there clearly can't be a God because God would be that designer, and if there's no designer, then there's no God. And so he says, you can still believe in God if you want to, but belief in God is, he says, tantamount to a delusion. He says it's, it, it's, in, it's unnecessary to posit God to explain what we see, and it's incredibly improbable. And he likes to also use the Occam's razor principle. If we don't need the postulation of God to explain things, then let's just use, go with the simpler explanation. And, and, and rely on purely unguided, undirected natural processes, in particular the natural selection random mutation mechanism, to explain how life got here, one of the big fundamental worldview questions. Now, that's one way of conceiving of the relationship between science and faith, that the two are in opposition to each other. There were two books in the late 19th century um, by two different hi historians who kind of did a revisionist thing on the history of science, and one was called The History of the Warfare Between Science and Christianity. Uh, Draper and White, I can't remember which wrote which title, but that's… Um, and so anyway, that's one of, the, one of the ways of conceptualizing the relationship between science and faith, that they're in conflict. They're in, there's a warfare between these two points of view, belief in God and, and, and accepting of the scientific picture of the world give you two completely diametrically opposed pictures. Now, another way of, of formulating that relationship, which is kind of a way of reconciling faith and science, is the way that was promulgated by Stephen Jay Gould in a book in 1999. Uh, the book was titled Rock of Ages, what he, the, but what he was advocating is more well known. It was called the non-overlapping magisteria concept. That science and faith are two completely different kinds of enterprises. Um, faith is about, he said, it's about uh, morality and meaning and subjective sense of purpose, perhaps, and, and science is about the facts. And the two don't really intersect, so they can't contradict each other because they're about such different things. And so this is, uh, and, and an awful lot of people who are in science departments at 
Christian colleges and universities have accepted this way of reconciling science and faith. That there, they, the, uh, one aphorism is, um, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Science tell you, tells you how the heavens go, how the planets move around the sun and so forth. But the Bible tells you something different. There are about two different subjects, and they never talk about the same things. So one is about facts, one is about faith and meaning and purpose and morality perhaps, okay? Now in arguments between the facts and the faith, who wins? The people who have the facts win those arguments. So what, this, is a, this is a kind of a peace treaty on very unfavorable terms to people who are of a mindset to think that God is real and that maybe God has acted in time, space, and history and maybe even left behind some evidence of that. Okay? Now, <clears throat> so it, this is very much contrary. The, both of these views are contrary to the biblical way of, con, of conceptualizing the relationship between the physical world, which we would study through science, and the reality of God. Uh, in the Psalms, Psalm 19, for example, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. In other words, there's something about nature that is attesting to the reality of God. They're not in two separate… science and faith aren't in two separate realms. The facts point to the object of our faith. Very different conceptualization. Um, and they're certainly not at odds because the facts are pointing to the reality of God. Romans in the New Testament, Romans 1, St. Paul says the same thing. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. Okay, so the physical evidence, the things we see around us, according to St. Paul, are bearing witness to the reality of the Creator. Very different viewpoint than the, that of the new atheist, wouldn't you say? Okay, not, not too surprising that the new atheists and the Bible writers disagree though. Okay, I guess that's not too surprising. We're not shocked to hear that. What, you, what might surprise you is that the viewpoint of the new atheists and indeed the viewpoint of Stephen Gould is very different. Those two viewpoints are very different than the viewpoint of the founders of modern science. If you go… and there's a period in the history of science known as the scientific revolution. And historians and philosophers of science um, have differing ways of dating that. Pretty much everyone agrees it was in full flower in the 16th and 17th century. Some would push the start of it back further because they see interesting changes going on in theology and in philosophy and in understanding the methods of science that go all the way back to, say, 1300. But in any case, the, the, the founders of many modern scientific disciplines and the, and the people who were thinking about how to investigate the natural world were very devout, mainly Christians. And they believed, actually, the, the, the picture you see on the screen is the front piece, the title page of one of the great early works of modern biology by a biologist named John Ray. And can you see that the title is actually a paraphrase of that verse that I just read in, from Romans? Some of the older tra tra translations would say that the eternal power and wisdom of the Creator are on display. This is Ray's translation. The wisdom of God manifested in the works of creation. And then he says, in two parts. And there are a lot of them. Okay, you can't put them all in one volume. Very cool. Um, so you find this tradition, the early modern science, well, first of all, they've got two key ideas. One, there's a number of neat ideas. They came right out of the biblical doctrine of creation. But one is the idea that nature is intelligible. It can be understood. It's worth the trouble to study nature carefully because it was designed by a rational intellect, by a mind, by the mind of God. In fact, the very same mind who designed our minds gave us the gift of rationality so that there was a correspondence between the rationality built into nature <coughs> and the kind of rationality that we were given. So we should expect to see a lawful order, one of the metaphors of the scientific revolution, the laws of nature. It's a biblical concept. It goes back to the book of Job. We should also expect to see design in nature because it was produced by, an, as Newton would later say, an intelligent and powerful being. 
So you have this assumption that nature can be studied profitably because it was designed by a rational agent who also made our minds capable of understanding the order and design that he put into nature. That's part of the inspiration for science. And so you see this with Kepler, you see it with Boyle, you see it with Newton. It's the, and some historians of science now call it the natural theological tradition. Well, so far I've been talking about one of the assumptions about nature that these guys made, and they brought it, it was an assumption that came from a biblical worldview. But they also, as they looked at nature, they saw evidence of design. They saw evidence of a lawful order. And so they wrote equations with precise math to describe the regular patterns that they saw in nature. Kepler thought that was a tremendous witness to the reality of the Creator behind that. But they also made design arguments about the particular configurations of matter, the special structures that they found. And this, this uh, reached an almost majestic quality in the works of Isaac Newton. He wrote a, a book on optics, uh, on the, the physics of light, and in it he described with some awe the correspondence between the optical properties of light and the way the mammalian eye functioned. It was as if the two had been designed with each of the other in mind, he argued. Unbelievable. Now, I had a kind of interesting experience a number of years ago. I was asked to testify before the United States Commission on Civil Rights. I didn't do anything wrong, I promise. And they were looking into the question of whether or not there was viewpoint, that whether there is viewpoint discrimination in the teaching of biological origins in the American public schools. When I heard what they were investigating, I thought, you don't need an investigation, just open a textbook. It's obvious. There's only one view of biological origins taught. It's the full-on Darwinian view, and it's not even that well taught. But certainly there are no criticisms of Darwinian evolution presented in any of the major biology textbooks, and no theories al alternative to the Darwinian view presented. Anyway, I was a, I was a good soldier and went and gave my three-minute testimony. And I was speaking as someone representing the theory of intelligent design, so I explained a little bit about what the theory was about. I had an opposite number at the hearing who was a lobbyist for the Darwin-only science education crowd. And um, she was sitting quietly while I answered questions about my three minutes, and one of the commissioners was started with a fairly aggressive line of questioning that made me think that he was trying to impeach my credibility, as the lawyers say. But then there was a point in the questioning where suddenly the, it seemed to turn a little friendlier, and he said, now, isn't this theory of intelligent design that you hold, isn't this pretty much the same idea as the idea that was advanced by the founders of modern science, like Kepler and Boyle and Newton? And when I heard the names of my heroes, my spirit brightened. And I said, well, yes, it is. It's very similar. And at that point, my opposite number in the hearing interjected. And she said, well, what Dr. Meyer says is right, but only in part, because it's true Newton was very religious. But she said he took great pains to keep his religious ideas about intelligent design out of his scientific writing. Now, I'm not one of these people that memorizes poetry or biblical text or… But at this point, I had in my briefcase an essay that I just finished, and I had a quote from Newton on the first page in block text. And it was pretty close. I didn't have it nailed, but I had it pretty close. Let me give you the quote from Newton, because I found myself saying something that sounded very impressive. I said, no, that's not true. Uh, in the general scolium to the Principia, does that sound pretty impressive? <laughs> scolium just means introduction, but they didn't know that, you know? Okay, so, and then I said, arguably one of the greatest works of physics ever written. And it was, it was the, it's the book where he put forth the theory of universal gravitation. It's the foundation of all classical physics. And I said, Newton wrote the following, and then I paraphrased, but here's the actual quote. I'll read it to you. Though these bodies may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, he's talking about the planets and the comets 
the things that are orbiting the sun. He's, he's going to argue that there's this universal law of gravity, but he's going to say, even if we understand that, that's not enough to explain the solar system because all the planets have been arranged. It was a setup job. All the planets were put in the right relationship to each other so that they can maintain these stable orbits. It's not, an easy, it's not easy to model even today how the, well, it's now they got rid of Pluto, didn't they? So, okay, the eight planets. I still love Pluto. Anyway, how all the nine planets, okay, stay in a stable orbit. But, so Newton's saying, look, you can't explain the stability of the solar system by reference to the law of gravity alone. And he thought the law of gravity was an ex a mode of divine action. He said it was the result of constant spirit action. That's what the laws of nature are. They're an expression of God's ordering of the, con the, the concourse of nature. But he said, no, we need something else. He says, yet they could by no means have derived their, the regular position of the orbits themselves from those laws. This, thus, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being, capital B. In the general scolium to the Principia. That's science, friends. He didn't separate his ideas about intelligent design from his science, and he didn't do it in the optics either. And virtually none of the founders of the scientific revolution did. But that all raises a big question, doesn't it? Oh, by the way, at the hearing, after I cited this, a couple of the commissioners suddenly smiled and thought, oh, this could be more interesting than we thought. <laughs> Maybe this guy has something to say. Anyway, what happened? How did we get from Newton to Dawkins and Bill Nye, the science guy? And, 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 um, Tyson, De, Neil Tyson de Graff, or Neil de Graff Tyson. How do we get to these new atheists who think they, they can tell, they're telling every the culture what science means, and what it means is atheism, or no God, or no design, or at least materialism. They, they may say, well, we're agnostic, but all we think that's really real is matter and energy. How do we get to that point? Well, it's, a, it's, it's actually a big story, and I'm telling it in some things I'm writing right now, but... <clears throat> There's, let's pick up one thread of the story. It's theories of origins. Newton dies in 1727. In 1796, a French physicist named Pierre Laplace publishes a book called The Celestial Mechanics. And in it, he attempts to do the very thing that Newton says you can't do, which is explain the origin of the solar system without reference to the activity of an intelligent and powerful being. He tries to explain it all as the result of the law of gravity. Whether or not he does or not is, in a way, a moot point, but he thinks he does. He later, apparently, is called in front of... It's a... Sorry, I'm off on the slides. He gets called to the Palace of Versailles to receive commendation from Napoleon. This is a few years later, 1801, 1802, something like that. And Napoleon says, look, Pierre, baby, you've made French science very proud. You've shown up the British, Newton and those guys. That's all very good. But I do wonder, I have a question. Newton talked about God so much in his work, you don't mention him at all. And Laplace is said to have puffed himself up and said, Sir, I have no need of that hypothesis. That was my French accent, by the way. Um, now, here's the funny story. He definitely did write the celestial mechanics. He did try to explain the solar system without reference to God, but we're not, we're not actually sure if this story is true. It's, it, historians say it may be ap apocryphal. But almost all historians will tell you w the words that were put into Laplace's mouth captured the spirit of 19th century science. Because across that period of time, one theory after another came online that attempted to account for the origin of striking features of the natural world without reference to a designing intelligence, a creator, God, but instead only by reference to purely undirected material processes. In geology, uh, you had scientists like uh, Hutton and then Lyell who explained the origin of the mountains, the canyons, the river deltas, the great dramatic features of the landscapes by reference to slow, unguided, undirected geological processes. In biology, following the developments in astronomy and geology, of course we have Charles Darwin who comes 
and publishes The Origin of Species, 1859, attempting to explain the appearance of design without a designing intelligence, only by reference to the unguided, undirected process of natural selection. His idea is later extended further in his own book called uh, The Descent of Man, where he applies his theory of evolution to the origin of human beings. And uh, other people pick up his idea and attempt to explain the very first life, the first cell, by reference to chemical reactions. That's called chemical evolutionary theory. So by the end of the 19th century, you have this kind of seamless narrative or story that can be told from the very beginning of the planet Earth to the <coughs> rise of the mountains and the creation of the river deltas and the canyons to the origin of the first life, to the origin of the new forms of life, to finally the origin of human life, one seamless materialistic story. And so we have biology textbooks today that say things like, by coupling the undirected purposeless variations to the blind, uncaring process of natural selection, Darwin made theological explanations of life superfluous. No need of that hypothesis. That's the 19th story, 19th century. Now, all of this resulted not just in new scientific theories, but in the rise of what scholars, historians of science refer to as the worldview or philosophy of scientific materialism. How many are familiar with the term worldview? I guess we're at an apologetics conference, most people. Okay. <laughs> so, um, one, one way to get a handle on worldview, one, one, a definition I like is that it's a, it's a coherent set of answers to some basic questions about reality. And perhaps the most basic question that any worldview addresses is the question that philosophers call the question of metaphysics or ontology. The, 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 writer, uh, the English professor I like who writes on worldview, James Sire, calls it the prime reality question. And I like the way he defines it. He says, what is the, the prime reality question addresses this question. What is the thing or the entity or the process from which everything else comes? Every worldview has to answer that question. And materialism gives that a, an answer to that question by saying, well, it's matter and energy. And if so by the end of the 19th century, when you have this seamless materialistic story about how you got from the nebular gases all the way to the first human being, that's a pretty impressive story. It's a scientific story. It's a series of theories, but it's also one that has worldview implications because it addresses this deep worldview question. So it's science and it's philosophy. It's uh, a dessert topping and a floor wax. Did, did, remember that? Oh, never mind. Saturday Night Live from the 70s. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is the really interesting thing about 19th century science. It ends up undergirding a completely different worldview interpretation of the significance of science than the one that gave rise to science in the period of the scientific revolution. And these theories of origin are one of the reasons that scientific materialism kind of comes to the fore. Now, this worldview thing is kind of interesting to me. When I was in college, I, um, I majored in physics and in geology. And um, part of the reason I did that is that my, my dad is a mechanical engineer, very good at math, very good at science, very analytical, and growing up, I never felt like I could ever be an engineer. Part of it was, I was if I'd help him fix something, like the car, I dropped the wrench to the inaccessible place and he'd come up going, oh, I wasn't adept that way. So I thought, I don't want to be an engineer. And he knew I didn't want to be an engineer. So he said, look, when you get to college, you can major in anything you want. You don't have to be an engineer. I know you don't want to be an engineer, but let me give you one piece of advice. Make sure that when you get there, you take at least two years of college math, because if you don't have the math, you're going, you're going to be limited in what you can choose. And I said, okay, Dad, oh, that sounds like good advice. So I, I took the two years of college math. Now, I went to a kind of small liberal arts college. After you take two years of college math, about all you can major in is math or physics, which was as close to engineering as they had at the small liberal arts college where I was, which I think is what my dad wanted all along. So I ended up doing math or in physics and in geology, but I was interested in these big philosophical questions. And I had a philosophy professor that I absolutely loved and he was so interesting. And I'd sneak across campus and get signed up for one of those classes every semester, whatever my science load was. And 
in the middle of my junior year, I came home and the report card came in the mail one day from the college. And I'm still, I'm still a junior in college, but we have this Germanic work ethic thing in our family. So my dad's intercepting the report card. I'm a junior in college. So he wants to talk to me about it over dinner. And he looks at the grades and he reads the names of the classes that I'm taking. And the first one is atheistic existentialism. That was one of the philosophy classes. And it was a great class. It was all about Nietzsche and Sartre and Camus and existential despair. And I was wallowing in it and getting a good grade and wallowing in existential despair. So he reads the grade, A. Next grade, theoretical mechanics. Then he tips his glasses down over his nose. We all have long noses in my family. And he says, B. <laughs> and then there's this look. And I just, the, the look in our family, that meant it is now time for offspring to give account for, of offspring's behavior. <laughs> and so I get very defensive and I say, Dad, 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 look, I know these philosophy classes don't mean anything to you. But, but, but the thing about philosophy is that's where you learn about people's worldviews. And atheistic existentialism is a very influential worldview. And you need to know about people's worldviews because if you don't understand the worldview, you don't understand why they use the words that they use and what they really mean when they say things and what their underlying assumptions are. And, and, and he, interestingly, he says, you don't need a worldview. You need a job. <laughs> uh, I, I, I tried to explain that that was an expression of a material... No, I put the <laughs> resume together. Um, anyway... The worldview that dominates our elite knowledge culture today is materialism. Sometimes it's called naturalism. It's the, that, another way of formulating it. Nature made of matter and energy is all that really exists. It's the fundamental thing from which everything else came. It's eternal and self-existent in the way that Jews and Christians, theists, think God is. So in a theistic worldview, you might th even think biblically, think in the beginning God said, or in the beginning was the Word, right? So before there's matter or information or anything, there is God who is a mind with consciousness and rationality and awareness. He's a, it's a personal God, okay? And from the mind of God issues forth the material world which He then shapes and to create all the things we see. That's the, a rough sketch of a theistic worldview. Mind first, matter second, mind shapes the matter. In the materialistic worldview, whereas in the, in the theistic worldview, God is eternal and self-existent and is the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause. In the materialistic worldview, matter or its energetic equivalent, matter and energy are the uncaused causes and they exist eternally, and they are self-existent, and they self-organize into all the complex things we see today. Eventually, the Darwinian process takes over, produces lots of different new forms of life, including us, and then one particular form of life, namely human beings, conceive of the idea of God. Does that sound familiar? Remember Freud? God did not create man, man created God. God exists in the naturalistic worldview, but he exists as a concept in the mind of man, okay? These two worldviews could not be more diametrically opposed. And can you see how, depending on which of those starting points you choose, you're going to come to different opinions on other important, say, moral issues? You might make very different choices about how you conduct your life, what kind of choices you make even for all kinds of things. So it, within the culture today, a lot of times the sociologists say we have a culture war. What we really have is a, is a conflict of visions, a, a, a differ, differing visions. And the materialistic or naturalistic worldview is the worldview that dominates the elite knowledge culture. The law schools, the media, the courts, big sections of the government, and especially the universities. And I was going to say especially the secular universities, but this worldview is so dominant in the places where professors go to be trained to become professors that even professors that then go and serve in Christian universities or colleges are very much affected by this way of thinking. Okay? So, if you're a proponent of the theistic worldview, all this comes as kind of bad news, 
If you're a pro proponent of the other worldview, you say, yeah, that sounds like sweet reason to me, okay? But that's just this is how deep the divide is, right? In any case, this materialistic worldview became dominant, became ascendant because of science, largely the science of the 19th century. Those different theories of origins that I was telling you about played a big role. Other ideas like um, Freud in the social sciences, his view of human nature was very much materialistic. He, was a, he held to a strong form of determinism. Marx was a materialist, a dialectical materialist who had a vision of the future. And think of those three great 19th century figures, Darwin, Marx, Freud. Darwin tells us where we came from, Marx where we're going, is a utopian vision of the future. Freud tells us about our essential nature and what to do about our guilt. Those are some really big questions that they're addressing. All three of them think they're doing it on the basis of scientific evidence and, and analysis. So you, this is another way to think of scientific materialism. The scientific ideas of the, of the 19th century, early 20th century give rise to this coherent worldview that's dominant, still with us today, and diametrically opposed to both biblical and, for that matter, just philosophical theism, the belief that the prime reality is God. Now, the story I want to tell today in the rest of the time we have um, <clears throat> concerns a series of discoveries that have challenged this way of thinking. And the, and, and the, the, the challenge starts in the field of cosmology. Remember my long story about getting from the nebular gases all the way to human beings? What did I leave out in that? The beginning of everything, yeah. Where did we get the matter in the first place? You help yourself to the nebular gases, but where'd that stuff come from? Well, in the 19th century, <clears throat> a lot of the, the philosophers in particular, but some of the scientists as well, seem to presuppose that matter and energy were just eternal and self-existent uh, near the end of the 19th century. This is kind of the, the dominant view. So people didn't think that much about it, but um, something was discovered that began to challenge that. This is one of the great 200-inch dome telescopes at the Palomar Observatory at Mount Wilson. Uh, these things came online in the 1920s, and there was an astronomer uh, named Edwin Hubble who began to make use of these brilliant pieces of technology. He was a, actually a lawyer first who came into astronomy at just the right time when they had the, the means to look into the night sky. Here's a picture of Hubble at his observations uh, station, and he began in the late 1920s to make observations of these tiny little points of light in the night sky that were, might have been stars, but people weren't sure. There had been a debate going on among astronomers as to whether or not the Milky Way galaxy, the one in which our solar system resides, was the only galaxy, or whether there might not be other galaxies beyond the Milky Way. And Hubble discovered something that settled the issue that little tiny points of light in the night sky that you might think were stars turned out actually, upon better resolution of the light, they turned out to be galaxies. And these are some of his original photographic plates. Now that was pretty exciting, and as we've gotten even better pictures of the night sky, we've been given a sense of the immensity of the universe that we didn't have before. This is a uh, keep your eye on that little quadrant of space. See all the galaxies within that quadrant? This is called the Hubble Deep Field. Now, the next slide I'm going to show you is a magnification of that. And wow, it's, it's galaxies galore. So you hold a little, maybe a dime at arm's length, and you think inside that dime, there are all those galaxies. Just extraordinary, vast, extraordinarily vast universe. Now, Hubble discovered something else about the, the galaxies. He discovered, based on the the, the, the signature of the light that was coming to him, that the galaxies were moving away from us in every direction of the night sky. The light that was coming in was shifted towards the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum, a little bit like the, um, the Doppler effect with sound, the train whistle, the L is moving away, from, the, the sound will have a drop in pitch, okay? And the light does the same thing. It stretches out. The wavelengths get longer, which is, corresponds to redder-looking light. 
and the light was shifted in the red direction for, with all the light coming to him. And from that he inferred that each of the galaxies was moving away from us. But if that was the case, then that meant the universe was in the forward direction of time expanding. So if you'll permit me, I have a little visual aid here. As we go forward in time, these are home-drawn home galaxies. The universe is expanding, getting larger and larger and larger as you go in the forward direction of time. That's pretty amazing. We live in an expanding universe. But then if you think about that a little more and you think about winding the cosmic clock back on the timeline, at any given point in the past, the universe would be a little smaller and a little smaller and a little smaller, and eventually you would have to get to the point where the expansion began. There was a beginning to the expansion of the universe, and from that it seemed logical to conclude that there was a beginning of the universe. Now this was very troubling to um, a famous physicist at Princeton University with very bad hair. Uh, <laughs> Albert Einstein. Einstein, in the teens, had formulated a theory of gravity, a new theory of gravity called general relativity. And he thought that, well, based on his theory, it, the, the math of his theory implied that the universe was expanding and then decelerating, but expanding from an initial point of a beginning again, from a kind of an explosive beginning. And this bothered Einstein because he had kind of taken in the default assumption of the 19th century that matter and energy were eternal and self-existent. They didn't have a beginning. They didn't have a starting point. They were just always there. But his own math seemed to imply there was a beginning. So he ended up fiddling with a particular value in his equation called the cosmological constant. And he arbitrarily set it so that the force of expansion of the universe and the force of gravitational contraction were exactly in balance. It was a completely arbitrary assumption. He had no scientific evidence to support this, but he just put the number, he assigned the number to the constant so that he could portray the universe as a static system that was neither expanding nor contracting, contracting and therefore must have always been here. And that satisfied him for a while, but the heavens talked back. And Hubble contacted Einstein and got him out to Pal the Palomar and had him observe what he was seeing through the telescope. And there's some famous newsreel footage where Einstein comes out, addresses the waiting media after having looked through the, uh, Hubble's telescope, and he says, I, I now see the necessity of a beginning. <laughs> that was the German, sorry. Um, a dramatic moment in the history of science. He later says that his cosmological constant um, dry labbing, as we used to call it in physics, um, was his, the greatest mistake of his scientific career, that he should have let the evidence determine his conclusion, not his philosophical assumptions. Now, there were other astronomers who didn't like this conclusion very much as well. One is Sir Arthur Eddington. He uh, was a, a British astrophysicist. And he said the following, he said, he had an alternative theory that he put forward, and, and he said this, he said, philosophically the notion of the beginning of the present order is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. I simply do not believe the present order of things started off with a bang. The expanding universe is preposterous. It leaves me cold. He was British. Um, now, in, in psychology, this is the theory we, we call denial. Do you, do you see the evidence that he's putting forward here? Why doesn't he like the theory? Philosophically, he doesn't like it. Okay, so what's the deal? Well, a, a later physicist, Robert Dickey at Princeton, put it this way very succinctly. He says, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of understanding the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. If matter is always here, it can be the prime reality. We don't need to think about something that creates matter or brings it into existence or causes the material universe to come into existence from something non-material, presumably. That's a mind-bender if you're a materialist. So this was the problem. 
In any case, the plot thickens. Have you guys seen, uh, you know who Stephen Hawking is, the, uh, the famous British physicist in the wheelchair. He has he's a really amazing personal story. The, he's the, has Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Anyway, there was a really interesting little film about him two years ago called Theory of Everything. Did anyone see it? Anyone? A couple? Okay, very good. And it tells the story of Hawking. He's working as a grad stu student as he's getting, he's, the symptoms are starting to manifest himself, but he's had this amazing idea. He's working on black hole physics. Black holes are where matter is so densely compacted that not even light can get out. And Hawking starts thinking about that in relation to the early universe. And he says if the universe is expanding outward in all directions, in the forward direction of time, then at some time in the finite past, matter would have gotten so densely compacted that it would have formed a black hole. And as you keep going back, eventually, because the density of matter, oh, I didn't tell you this. In, in Einstein's theory of gravity, matter curves space. Space tells matter how to go, and the matter curves the space. So, Hawking's thinking, as you go back far enough in time, that matter is going to get tighter and tighter and tighter bunched together. The space will get tighter and tighter curved, which will cause the matter to get tighter and tighter. And eventually, you're going to get to what he calls a singularity, a beginning point where the curvature of space will correspond, will become infinitely tight. Because after all, we're going back in time. At some point, you've got to get to the beginning of the expansion. So it's going to get infinitely tight. And infinitely tight curvature corresponds to something so tight you can't put anything in it. No spatial volume. So how much space is in no, how much stuff is in no space? No space, no stuff, no stuff, no matter. So now we're looking at a picture of, oh, well, here's the, the fun thing is the, the story, in the, in the film, they tell the story of his PhD examination. And there's a famous physicist on the other side of the table named Roger Penrose, and the different examiners are nitpicking various parts of the thesis. But then Penrose, this Oxford physicist, pushes the book across the table, and he says, Stephen, he says, uh, he says but in chapter, Stephen, this idea in chapter three, it's the idea about the singularity theorem. He said, it's brilliant. He says, and then he pushes the book across the, the table and says, now, Dr. Hawking, meaning he'd passed, go work out the math. Five years later, Hawking and Penrose team up and they solve what are known as, well, they solve one set of what are, what are called the field equations of general relativity. And in so doing, they are able to formally establish with the best physics we have that there was in fact such a singularity where the laws of physics break down, the curvature of space becomes infinitely tight, the universe at that moment of singularity has no spatial volume. It's a scientific picture of what the, the medieval theologians described as creatio ex nihilo, creation out of literally nothing physical. How can you use the laws of physics to explain the origin of the universe if the laws of physics break down at the point at which the universe originates? You're stuck. All right, there's a lot more to say about this, but one thing that's pretty obvious is that, um, well, I'll test you on this afterwards. Yeah, the <laughs> um, yeah here's the picture. Curvature, tighter, 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 back to the beginning. I mean, there, there's an obvious connection here to the biblical account, right? One of the things that the Bible said, contra all those 19th century philosophers and scientists, there was a beginning, in the beginning. It even refers to the beginning of time. It refers to the, the, the plan of God existing before the beginning of time. Another thing about this interesting discovery is it resuscitates an ancient argument for God's existence called the Kalam cosmological argument. The argument went like this, everything that begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist. The universe, therefore, must have a cause separate from itself. The material universe must be caused by something non-material. What does that sound like? Well, the ancient philosophers called it, we call that cause God. Um, the thing that was always doubted about this argument was the second premise. How do we know the universe had a beginning? Science has now shown us that it had a beginning. All right, lots more we could say about this. and I'll field questions, but here's another amazing discovery. It's from a related field, physics. In the 1950s, one of the people who opposed the Big Bang was an atheistic philosopher named Fred Hoyle. But he played an important part in another discovery that absolutely shook his atheism. It was the discovery of the fine-tuning of the fundamental laws of physics. 
as he was, he was a guy who worked on theories of nucleosynthesis in stars, how all the elements got built in, in stars. And it turned out that there were so many different factors, the strengths of several different independent laws that had to be just right for it to be possible to make carbon readily in our universe, that Hoyle was blown away when he discovered all these different factors and was able, it's a big story, but it's fascinating. And um, we need, the thing is carbon, we need carbon. It makes long chain-like molecules that can store energy and store information. And Hoyle realized it was essential to life, and yet the odds of building carbon were, were exponentially small. At least three different separate fundamental forces of physics had to be perfectly finely tuned to make it possible for carbon to be formed readily from, from simpler elements. And he was so struck by this that he, he later, he lost his faith in atheism and embraced a form of theism, belief in God. And this is what he said. He said, a common sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry as well as biology to make life possible. And I like to say that I like the way the monkeys always make it into the origins theories, <laughs> even in physics. Now, this, the, the fine-tuning parameters that Hoyle was part of discovering were only a, a, a few, three, of about three or four dozen. And, some, and one, one physicist, uh, famous British physicist, John Polkinghorne, has used a visual illustration to get this across. It's called a, he, he calls it a universe-creating machine. He says, imagine you go into a space station somewhere out in space, and you go into the control room, and it's, it says, universe-creating machine. And then you start looking at the dials, and because you're a physics geek, you start making calculations, and you realize each one of those dials is set exactly where it needs to be in order for life to be possible. And then you're tempted to turn one of the dials, and they slap your hand and say, no, 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 don't touch that. You make it one click over, and life ceases to exist. We live in a Goldilocks universe where everything is not too hot, not too cold, not too strong, not too weak. And Polkinghorne says, what do you make of that, if that were really the universe-creating machine? And then he, I got to interview him once, and he said, well, I don't say that the atheist is stupid. I just say that theism provides a more satisfying explanation. <laughs> and the explanation is design. It's intelligent design, and this is what Hoyle is referring to as well. Now, people have tried to explain this away today. If you know anything about the debates going on about biological and cosmological origins, you probably know about something called the multiverse hypothesis. Interesting thing you should know about that. That's the idea that there's a gabillion other universes out there making the incredible fine-tuning in our universe probable on a cosmic scale, like we were just the lucky ones that won the, the cosmic lottery. The problem is that all the mechanisms that have been proposed for generating new universes require even more exquisite fine-tuning than the universe we find, than the fine-tuning we have in our universe. So to explain fine-tuning, you have to invoke prior, more precise fine-tuning, which is no solution at all. Um, okay, one last area of science, and it's the area that I happen to work on, and I'll talk a lot more about this tomorrow night, and maybe a bit more if uh, any of you come to the Sunday School classes tomorrow. But it's the whole issue of, um, well, the origin, origin of life, the origin of new forms of life. If you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? Programming? Any? Code? Memory? Information? Okay. We're familiar with these concepts, right? These are all right answers, okay? It, this is, here's the big discovery of modern biology. It turns out the same thing is true in life. If you want to build a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form of life, or if the evolutionary process is to do it, you, new information is required. If you want to explain the origin of the first life from simpler pre-existing chemicals, you have to have information to build the molecules that are necessary to sustain a cell. Um, Biological form requires biological information. That's the, that's the, uh, the, 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 um, the, mess, the, the moral of the story here. 1953, Watson and Crick discover the structure of the DNA molecule, the double helix molecule. 
Four years later, Crick realizes that the molecule, which has this beautiful double helix structure, has these, it has these, they, and down the middle it has this, these chemical subunits called bases. And Crick realizes that the bases are likely functioning as alphabetic characters in a written language or like the digital characters in a machine code, like the zeros and ones in computer code. That is to say, it's not their chemical properties or their shape or their molecular weight or anything like that that matters to their function. What matters is the arrangement of these chemical subunits in accord with a code which later they discover. And so this is known as the sequence hypothesis, and Crick turns out to be right. Interesting thing about Crick is that in World War II he was a code breaker, and he ends up breaking the ultimate code, the code of life. Now, this is where my previous observation comes in, is that the, the information along the spine of the DNA molecule is necessary for building larger molecules called proteins that perform all the important jobs in the cell. Proteins um, catalyze reactions, they build molecular machines, they process information, they do all kinds of important jobs, but you can't build them unless you have the information on DNA. In Seattle, we have two great companies, well, lots of great companies, but two come to mind. Microsoft, which writes code and sells it, information as a product. The Boeing company takes code and uses it to build airplanes. It's called CAD-CAM, Computer Assisted Design and Engineering. The engineer sits at a console, writes code, the information goes down a wire, it's translated into a machine code that can be read at a manufacturing apparatus, and then that information is used, for example, to put rivets on the airplane wing at just the right place information building mechanical systems. Something very much like that is going on inside cells. And that raises a big question. I call it the DNA enigma. It, it's not where the, DNA, the information is stored in DNA. We now know that. We, we know the structure of DNA, thanks to Watson and Crick. The DNA enigma is what? Where'd the code come from? Where'd the code come from? And this is what has really interested me for now over 30 years, and um, I got interested in this question of the origin of the information necessary to build life when I first met a scientist named Charles Thaxton. I was working as a geophysicist in an oil company. Conference came to town where the origin of life was being discussed. They were talking about the origin of the first life, the first living cell, and it turned out that that the, 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 science, that the study of that subject was at an impasse because scientists could not explain where the information came from to build cells. And Thaxton and his colleagues who wrote a book called Mystery of Life or, The Mystery of Life's Origin suggested that the missing element here was that information question and that maybe we were barking up the wrong tree. That information in our experience tends to come from a mind or a mind, it's a mind product. And so they suggested that maybe to explain the origin of life and the information in DNA, we needed to invoke an intelligent cause. I got to know Thaxton after this conference. I ended up a year later going to grad school in England. I did a PhD on the subject of origin of life biology. And I, when I left, I wasn't totally convinced of Thaxton's idea, but I was really intrigued. And I had a question in my mind, which was, could the information in DNA, could it actually be pointing to an intelligent cause? And was there a way to show that scientifically? And interestingly, as I studied the method of historical scientific reasoning that Darwin used, there was a key idea I came across from one of Darwin's mentors. And it was this, that when you're trying to explain an, an event in the remote past, you should look for causes that are known from our present experience to have the power to produce the effect in question. That idea came from a scientist named Charles Lyell. The phrase that tipped me off was in the title page to his book. He said, when we're trying to explain the former changes on the Earth's surface, we should be looking for causes now in operation. And I thought to myself, what is the cause now in operation for the production of digital code? What do we know from our experience about what it takes to generate information? And not long after I posed that question, I came across a passage in a little book written by an early pioneer in the application of what's called information theory to molecular biology. 
and he said that the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. That's what we know from our uniform and repeated experience about the causes that produce information, about the causes now in operation. And I thought, if that's true, then using this method of scientific reasoning that Darwin used, that Lyell used, that the other founders of modern historical scientific reasoning use, that the evolutionary biologists use, we ought to be able to make a powerful scientific argument for design, for intelligent design, because we know of only one known cause that produces information. Bill Gates, our local hero in Redmond, Washington, says, DNA is like a computer program, but far more advanced than any we've ever created. What does it take to generate a computer program? What do we know from our experience about what it takes to generate a computer program? A programmer! In fact, whenever we see information, especially when we see it in a digital or alphabetic form, and we trace that information back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind not a material process, whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or a ra information embedded in a radio signal or even, here's an irony, even the computer programs that evolutionary biologists like Richard Dawkins write to demonstrate the plausibility of the natural selection random mutation mechanism and its ability to generate information, even those programs require information from an intelligent source. They have to be programmed. You even have to give the computer this sequence you eventually want it to converge on. It's a total cheat. The programmer is doing all the important work in simulating how evolution would work. So information is always a mind product. It is always a mind product. And that implies, and this is the argument of my book Signature in the Cell, and in a slightly different form I make the argument in Dar Darwin's Doubt, that when we see when we find information at the very foundation of life, and when we see later big infusions of information necessary to generate novel forms of life, what we're actually looking at is evidence of intelligent design, the evidence of intelligent activity in the, in the key events in the history of life. So I'll talk more about this, the biology part of this tomorrow night, but in summary, I think we have a very exciting new synthesis that's emerging. From cosmology, we've learned that the material universe itself has a definite beginning in time and space. Even time and space have a beginning. From physics, we've learned that since the very beginning of the universe, there has been evidence of design built into the very fabric of the universe in what we call the fine-tuning of the laws of physics and chemistry. And from biology, we see evidence down the timeline well after the beginning of infusions of information into the cosmos and into the biosphere, suggesting a creator who is active after the beginning. If we only had evidence from the cosmology and the physics, we might say it was a deistic creator. If we only had evidence from the biology, we might, as Richard Dawkins has once speculated in the film Expelled, maybe we could think of a, some imminent intelligence in some other intelligent civilization, an alien intelligence that evolved long after the Big Bang and then seeded life on Earth. But the combination of these evidences suggests not deism, not space alien designer, certainly not materialism, which can't explain any of them, but it instead suggests a theistic creator who create, acts at the beginning, but then is also actively involved in the creation after time equals zero. And I call that the return of the God hypothesis and agree with the historian Frederick Burnham who says that the idea that God created the universe is a more respectable hypothesis today than any time in the last 100 years. In fact, I'd go further and say that the, the theistic design, the God hypothesis, provides the best explanation for our most cutting-edge discoveries about biological and cosmological origins. Or another way to say it is that uh, Newton and St. Paul were right, and Richard Dawkins is wrong. Thanks very much.